I think uh, most of us would uh, probably have a, a fairly good understanding of the uh, importance of balance uh, when it comes to things like our uh, physical bodies and the uh, areas of our life that uh, if they get out of balance, we uh, know uh, immediately that something is very wrong. Uh, We notice very quickly that our equilibrium is out of out of whack. You know, we get those uh, inner ear infections and they make us dizzy because that messes, that's where our equilibrium is, is in the fluid in our inner ear. And uh, if, if something gets messed up with that, then we have trouble keeping our balance. We, we fall down, we stumble into stuff. And, you know, as, as little children, we all played those games where uh, uh, one uh, kid or a group of kids would take uh, one of the children in the group and spin them around and around and around and around and until they couldn't hardly stand up and then they would all jump back and laugh as the dizzy child tried to tag them and falling down and stumbling around because they're so dizzy their equilibrium is messed up. Uh, if you didn't know what causes that, when you spin like that, what makes you dizzy is it's that fluid in your inner ear gets uh, spun out and, and uh, until it settles, uh, you're dizzy. And so we understand the importance of balance. When a child is learning to, to, to ride their bike, you know, and, and, and we, we see people riding around on their bicycles and it just looks so effortless. They just jump up on the bike and phew, they're gone. But take a little child that hasn't learned how to balance on that bike and they fall down and they fall down and they fall down. And uh, then when they get it, they've got their balance. And, you know, the old saying, once you learn how to ride a bike, you never forget. Or, or we say it's like riding a bike, you know, once you know how to do it. Because the balance is there. You know how to balance. And it just becomes natural that, that you're balanced in that way. So we understand the uh, importance of balance, especially those who uh, have, have uh, struggled with, with uh, vertigo and, and uh, with, with uh, balance problems and being able to keep your focus. And uh, when, when we have our balance, we, we really appreciate it because we know what it's like to struggle with not having it. As we uh, talk about the importance of balance in things like our physical bodies and in uh, uh, things like our uh, time management, our priorities, you know, we have to be balanced in our priorities, and we understand if we get our priorities out of whack, we lose balance in our priorities, then things kind of spin out of control, and uh, then we're just kind of living life like the uh, person who says their life is uh, like an ambulance. They live, like, uh, they live life like an ambulance, just rushing from one emergency to the other with sirens wide open. Well, that's, that's not balance, and, and it begins to wear on us, and we understand that we're out of balance. And as, as much as we understand the importance of balance uh, in our physical bodies, in our physical life, and we understand the importance of balance in the activities of our life and balancing our priorities and balancing our time and uh, having balance in those things and, and how important it is to, to maintain balance in those, uh, in those areas. When it comes to our spiritual lives, uh, it's not... Just as important to be balanced, it's more important. It's more important. Just like uh, everything that we compare to our spiritual lives, we know it's, it's important to be balanced in our physical bodies because that's part of our physical health. We know that it's important to be balanced in our uh, 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 activities, our, our, our uh, uh, professional lives, our personal lives. We understand the importance of balance there. But it's not just as important to be balanced spiritually, it's more important just as with all aspects of our spiritual life. They are so much more important than the way that we compare to our physical lives, or our, our earthly existence. Our spiritual lives are so much more important. And as we talk about the place of balance in the Christian life, there, there are a lot of misconceptions about what balance is. And I would say that uh, the majority of people, whether they realize it or not, when they think about balance, they they may actually be thinking about balance from a worldly perspective rather than from a spiritual perspective. And and so we we first want to to 
uh, understand what worldly balance is, what, what looking at balance from a worldly perspective is, because for, for most people, that idea of balance to them, when, when you hear the word balance, just like you see the uh, graphic on the screen there, you know, it's balanced when the arrow is, is uh, straight up and down. You know, you got equal over here and equal over here, and so it's right in the middle. And, and, and uh, that's how people generally think of balance. But balance doesn't just mean in the middle. Think about this. A person who is and considers themselves to be uh, liberal, you know, whether that's uh, politically liberal, socially liberal, uh, you know, however you think of liberal, somebody who thinks of themselves as liberal, well, they think of themselves in the middle, in the balanced perspective of being liberal. Somebody who is, uh, you know, considers themselves to be, you know, just an ultra conservative, a staunch conservative, however you think about that, socially, politically, however you think about that. Somebody who considers themselves to be uh, conservative. Well, they think of themselves as being in the middle of conservatism, don't they? Nobody thinks of themselves as being a radical, do they? You know, I have my perspective of things, and, you know, from my perspective, I'm right where I need to be. I'm right in the middle. (laughs) I'm not too far to the left. I'm not too far to the right. From your perspective, you may look at me and you may say, man, Norm is a radical nut far out there on the right. And some others may look at me and say, man, Norm's a crazy liberal way over on the left. But from my perspective, I'm right where I'm, I'm supposed to be. I'm right in the middle. I'm not too far right. I'm not too far left. I'm balanced. See, I think of myself that way. You think of yourself that way. Nobody thinks of themselves as being out of balance. We think of ourselves from our perspective that we're, we're, in the, we're right where we're supposed to be. But balance isn't from our perspective, is it? See, if, if we're using our own standard as our perspective of balance, well, then our idea of balance isn't what it's supposed to be. Uh, think for a minute about where we consider ourselves to be in the spectrum of uh, morality, for example. And, and, and we would consider ourselves, I would say most of us here, if not all of us here, would consider ourselves to be very balanced when it comes to moral issues. We have the balanced view of things like uh, uh, homosexuality, things like uh, adultery, things like fornication, things like uh, beverage alcohol. We, we uh, uh, think about our view on those things, and, and we think that we're, we're balanced on those things. But now, consider how somebody from the world would look at your perspective of those things and would look at where you are, somebody in the world that is looking from a worldly perspective, looking at you and where you are in in such things as uh, homosexuality or abortion or drunkenness, things like that. And and, and now, unless I don't know something about you that I probably ought to know, (laughs) uh, they would look at you and they would think that you were just way out of balance on those issues. And, and likewise, we, we look at them and we, we uh, think that the, those views, they're just way out of balance on those issues. And, and the problem is we're looking at those things from our perspective. That's the, the worldly balance. It's where, where we make where we are the standard. You know, we all have our personal standards and, and whatever, you know, whatever you want to look at, we all have our personal standards in those things, like uh, attending the worship services. You know, sometimes uh, uh, I, I think, well, you know, why did they miss the services for that? I would never miss the services for that. Well, I'm looking at that from my, based on my standard. I, I, I've gone to worship services when I was sick with food. I've been up all night, uh, you know, Doing what you do when you have food poisoning. And yet, take a shower, get dressed, and go to services after not having any sleep. 
I remember one time sitting in the cry room at the auditorium I was attending at that time, had a cry room in the back with a sheet of glass between the cry room and the auditorium. So you were, it was like being in the auditorium, but you really weren't. And I was sitting in the cry room because I wasn't sure the sickness had passed and I didn't want to disturb the auditorium if I had to jump up and run out. And, 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 and yet we, we, you know, check on some people sometimes that, that have missed the worship service and they, they uh, say, well, you know, I had, I had a, a, a headache and so I, I stayed home. And I think, well, you know, a headache? <laughs> well, I don't know. For them, that might be really bad. For me, I think I could cope with it. But see, I'm judging that based on my standard. I can't bind my standard. I can't say my standard is, is the middle point, is the balance point. And so if you're not where I am on that, well, then you're leaning too far to the left or you're leaning too far to the right. And I know I joke sometimes, you know, when we're having our Bible, in the Tuesday Bible class a lot, uh, I'll joke and I'll, I'll uh, give a uh, point from the passage and uh, I'll laugh and I'll say, now you can disagree with me and be wrong if you want to. That's up to you. <laughs> well, you know, I hope everybody understands. I'm kidding when I say things like that. Because, you know, I, I, have, I have my perspective on that. And if it's a matter of opinion, I'm entitled to my opinion. You're entitled to your opinion. And you can be wrong if you want to. That's okay. Right? <laughs> but we can't bind our own personal standards on other people. See, that's, that's where I'm supposed to be because that's my personal standard. But I can't bind that on other people. And so it's not just being in the middle because we all think we're in the middle when it comes to, to uh, uh, what balance is. Uh, think about Israel's desire for a king for a moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 8. And you remember how when they came to Samuel uh, asking for a king. And, and God told Samuel that uh, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. And, and we look at that sometimes and, and we, we think that, you know, when God said that, what he meant was that he was supposed to be their king. They weren't supposed to have a human king, that he was supposed to be their king. And, and uh, because they wanted a human king, they were rejecting God from being their king. Well, that's, not, that's not what that means. It, they, they were rejecting God's rule over them. That's true. But you go back to passages like Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, where, where Jacob, all the way back in Genesis, when he was talking about where his sons would be, what, what his son's role would be in the, in the coming kingdom, that the nation that would be established from his sons, he said of Judah... The scepter, that is the king's scepter, the scepter would not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And then you go over to uh, places like uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 17. And you see there in the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, the law of Moses that would govern the children of Israel in the kingdom, in the, the, the promised land that God was giving them, there's regulation there for the conduct of the king. You know, I was just uh, reading about uh, 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 the, the great reformer King Josiah and how they found the book of the law in the temple and brought it to Josiah, and Josiah read it and was so grieved that they hadn't been following and he tore his clothes, and he went and he gathered all the people and he stood up and he read the law to the people. Well, it's in Deuteronomy that it says the king is supposed to read the law to the people. And that there's these laws governing. And I can just imagine Josiah read what Deuteronomy said about the king and about how the king is supposed to conduct himself. And he was, he was so grieved that, that he hadn't been following that because he was a good king. And he, he got rid of the idolatry out of Jerusalem and, and Judea. Uh, and and uh, when he, he read that, he wanted to restore what it said there. Well, he, part of what he read would have been how the king is supposed to be... Uh, conduct himself. So God had laws for kings. But where did God say the king was supposed to come from? From Judah. But when the children of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 8 went to Samuel to say, give us a king. What was the standard that they were looking at in their desire for a king? To make us like the nations around us. That, that a king can judge us as the nations around us. It says there in 
verse 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now make us a, a king to judge us like all the nations. Then in verses 19 and 20 of 1 Samuel chapter 8, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. See, they were looking at the nations around them, and they saw these these warrior kings leading these nations around them, and they wanted to be like those nations. Well, they weren't supposed to be like those nations. They were supposed to be God's chosen people, different from those nations, separated from those nations by the law that God Himself gave them. And in the law that God Himself gave them, what are, what are the books of Moses, the, the Torah, the Jewish law? Well, Genesis is the first book of Moses, a book of law. We read it as a book of history. Well, that was the foundation for their law. Just like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are the foundation books for our law in Christ, the Christian law. We have Now, I understand Jesus lived under the law of Moses. He functioned as a Jew under the law of Moses. But what was He giving? He was giving His law. He was laying the foundation for His law. Well, that's what uh, Moses was doing in his record of Genesis. He was showing the, 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 the foundation for the law that he would give in, uh, beginning in Exodus chapter 20 with the Ten Commandments and then going on into Numbers with the book of the covenant and then the second giving of the law in Deuteronomy. Well, Genesis was laying the foundation for that, just like the Gospels lay the foundation for the Christian law. And he said in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10 that the king that would be over the children of Israel would be from the tribe of Judah. Just like he made uh, Levi the priestly tribe, he made Judah the kingly tribe. And he gave laws to govern the king. So, when Samuel brought Saul to them, a Benjamite, tall, good-looking, powerful, warrior-looking man, and brought this Benjamite to the children of Israel and said, Here's your king. Why did not the children of Israel jump up and say, No, he can't be our king. Because Jacob said that the kings would come from Judah. Saul's not from Judah. Why didn't they do that? Because the word of God was not their standard for what they wanted. Their standard for what they wanted was the worldly standard. They were looking for balance in a worldly way. They were looking at the world around them and they were saying, we want to be where they are. That's our middle point. That's our balance point. We want to be where they are. We want a king like they have. And their kings, the way they pick their kings, is they pick the biggest, strongest, tallest, best looking of their people and they say, he's our king and he's the one that leads them out to battle. That's what we want. Well, that's what Saul was. Their standard was wrong. That's a worldly standard. And so, we see today, in many congregations, isn't that the standard being used by many congregations of the Lord's church today? They look around at the world. They look around at the, you know, just like it says there in in 1 Samuel chapter 8, they looked at the nations around them. Well, the church today, in many places, many congregations that that, uh, want want to be uh, big, elaborate, powerful, or rich, or whatever, congregations, they look around at the nations around. See, we're a nation, we're a kingdom, aren't we? The kingdom of Christ, the church of Christ, we're a kingdom. And these congregations look around at the other nations around them, the denominations, the the, the churches that are established by man-made standards, not the Word of God. They look around at those churches and they say, well, man, look how big and and, 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 uh, vibrant they are. We need to do things the way they do them. Well, that's not our standard. That's what Israel did. And many congregations have gone astray in the pursuit of worldly balance. We need to be concerned with and we need to understand the importance of biblical balance 
in the Christian life. Now what's the difference between worldly balance and biblical balance? Worldly balance is looking around at at, at a worldly standard, like Israel did in their desire for a king, and saying, "That's that's our balance point. That's where if we can do that, that'll put us in the middle and that's where we want to be. But that's not biblical balance. When we talk about biblical balance, it can be summed up in this phrase. The true perspective of right and wrong. See, the Bible gives us the, the, the zero point, the balance point, the middle point. Where if we get you know, too much weight over here and it pulls it out of balance, well then we're not where the Word of God is. We're out of balance. If we put too much weight over here, it pulls us this way and we're out of balance. We're not where the Word of God is. See, the Word of God is our balance point. It's the true perspective of right and wrong. It's not my perspective. It's not your perspective. It's the true perspective of God's Word. That's the balance point. That's biblical balance. Uh, It's based solely on the standard of God's Word. In uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, for example. It says there, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, that's that's an important phrase when it comes to determining balance. Walk. And he says there how we know that we are balanced. How we know we have balance in our lives as Christians. Because we're walking where He walks. We're walking in the light. Our lifestyle is after the standard of Christ. The light there is the Word of God. The truth. And we're living our lives according to that truth. We're walking where He walks, in the light, as He is in the light. So that we can have fellowship with one another. You look back at Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 32 and 33. And it says there, Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. So you go in, you're going to go take the land. When you get in there to take that land, you walk right where my word tells you to walk. If you're walking down a straight way and you start to veer off to the left, and it's a narrow way, a difficult way, and you start to veer off to the left, where are you going to go? In the ditch. If you start to veer over to the right, where are you going to go? You're going to go in the ditch. And so he says, don't go either to the left or the right. Stay right where I put you. Follow my word. Keep my word. Don't go over here from my word. Don't go over there from my word. Stay right in my word. I I had just uh, made reference to the the, uh, law for the kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 20... As you see him giving the uh, uh, principles for uh, the kings, he says there in verse 20, I'll start with verse 18. And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. The king was supposed to sit down and take the book of the law and write himself his own copy of it. That's significant, isn't it? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a governing uh, 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 body? If we had presidents and governors and senators who, when they were elected, the first thing they did when they got elected is they went in their office and they laid out the New Testament of Jesus Christ and they started to write themselves a copy of it with their own hand, word for word, so that it was in their heart. And so they had a copy of it and they followed it. 
Now, we know they had to write their own copy of it because they didn't have a printing press. Uh, you know, there, there's a uh, uh, campaign has been going on for, for a long time. I don't know exactly who does it, but they send Bibles to all the people in, in government. They need their copy of the Bible to walk just where God walks, to walk just where God puts them. Now, you know, they, they don't read it. They don't follow it. But they're supposed to have it. And so he says there, uh, And it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be, now notice it, and be careful, be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes that, this, uh, that, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So so Moses told the children of Israel, you stay right in God's word. Don't go to the left, don't go to the right. To the kings that are governing the children of Israel, they're supposed to stay right in the word. They're supposed to have their own copy of it and to read it all their lives so that they don't stray to the left or to the right. See, that's balance. That's staying right where God puts you. That's biblical balance. It says in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 4, Jesus talking about the Pharisees. And in the Pharisees, we get a good example of what it means to stray to the right of God's Word, binding where God hasn't bound. And he says there, the scribes and the... I'm starting in verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That is, they're in the position of authority. They're in the position of governing authority. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. They're in the position of governing authority. Respect their authority. Do what they tell you to do. Whatever they tell you to do, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. Now notice it. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. And Jesus exposes their hypocrisy. But he he says they bind heavy burdens. You know, one of the the things that the the Pharisees were known for is how uh, uh, radically uh, careful they were to protect the law. And there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. You know, I I, uh, am am, am, uh, very careful. I try to be very careful that what I teach is just what the Bible says, that I don't go to, to to the right or to the left of what the Bible says, to just say what God said, to speak as the oracles of God. I try to be very careful about that. And there's nothing wrong with that. The, The problem with the Pharisees is that they kind of came up with this plan, this idea, that, well, you know, if, if, uh, if it's against the law to, to uh, uh, go over 40 stripes when, when somebody is receiving the judicial punishment of, of uh, uh, whipping, if it's against the law to go beyond 40 stripes, well then, let's make it 39. And let's say if you go more than 39 stripes, now you've broken the law. Because, you know, people might lose count. So they 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 saw where the law was and then they came out from that. And they put a hedge out here to keep people from getting close to the... To the you know, one of the reasons we don't know 
Whether God's name in the Old Testament is pronounced Jehovah or pronounced Yahweh, people you know, generally uh, have come to the consensus now that it's pronounced Yahweh, but really we don't know. It's Tetragrammaton, and we don't know how they pronounced it because the Jews would not say it. See, that's, that's an example of that hedge. It's against the law to take the Lord's name in vain, uh, Moses said in the Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And so what did they do? They came out from that and they set a hedge and they said it's against the law to even say the name of God. And if you even said Jehovah or Yahweh, then, then they would say you blasphemed. That's why we have in the King James and the translations that have come uh, from that, that it's all capitalized Lord, L-O-R-D, because we don't really know how it's pronounced. And it's from that pharisaic mentality well let's put a hedge out here to keep people well that's they're binding where god didn't bind and 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 people do that today they they come out from god's law and they say well if this is what god's law says well then let's tell people well you can't even do this much you can't get that close to it well that's binding where god has not bound you know people people uh, come to the conclusion well you know paul said that Uh, it was wrong for the way the Corinthians, the way they had corrupted the Lord's Supper, and so to avoid that danger altogether, let's say it's wrong to even eat in the place where you worship. Well, that's binding where God hasn't bound. Now, if that's your personal preference, great, fine. That's like I was talking about earlier. We can't bind our own personal preferences on other people. But if you say that's a law, where if you do different than this, you're committing a sin. Well, then that's what the Pharisees did. They bound where God did not bind. And God has never bound anywhere restrictions on where you are and are not allowed to eat. He gave specific instructions on how to worship. Now, if you start putting a steak dinner up here on the table and calling that the Lord's Supper, that's wrong. That doesn't have anything to do with where we, where we have our meals. See, so, so that's coming out from the law and binding where God hasn't bound. That's just one example. And binding where God hasn't bound. And then, then you had the Pharisees who were on the opposite. They, they were going to the left and they were loosing where God hadn't loosed. And they were saying, well, this doctrine, it, it's, it's, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna accept that doctrine. We're not gonna hold to that doctrine. We're gonna loose that doctrine. We're, we're, we're gonna say that doctrine doesn't matter or it's not real or what have you. That was the Pharisees, or the uh, Sadducees. So you had the Pharisees going off the, the road to the right and you had the, the uh, Sadducees going off the road to the left. And you remember Jesus when he talked to the Sadducees? And they asked him about the woman who was married to seven brothers according to the Levitical marriage law in the Old Testament. If, if, a bro, if a man didn't have an heir to leave his inheritance to, then uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, brother of the man was supposed to take his wife and have an heir in his brother's name. It, that, that, that child would bear his brother's name and receive his brother's inheritance, not his. And so this woman uh, was married to all seven brothers and none of them had an heir. And so they ask him in the resurrection, whose who's, uh, uh, wife... Uh, will she be in Mark chapter 12? In the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And they thought they had Jesus trapped. They thought they had Jesus in a conundrum to show that this doctrine that Jesus was teaching about the resurrection wasn't true. They wanted to loose people from that doctrine of the resurrection. Jesus said, you don't know. You, you're, you're mistaken because you don't know uh, the scriptures nor the power of God. Mark chapter 12 and verse uh, 24. You don't know. You're, you're loosing things that, that are not to be loosed. And so Jesus dealt with that. People, people going to the right and to the left. That's not biblical balance. That's why it's so important that we prove all things. As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Prove all things or test all things. Hold fast what is good. See, there's the balance point. We, we take the Word of God and, 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 and this view that is being presented. We take the Word of God and we say, well now, is this, is this uh, uh, teaching, is this doctrine, you know, is, is what Norm's saying today, is it to the left of God's Word? Because if it is, we're not supposed to take it. We're not supposed to follow it. 
Is it to the right of God's word? Because if it is, we're not supposed to follow it. Or is, is, is what uh, the preacher or the teacher or whoever's talking to me, is what they're teaching right in line with God's word? Because if it is, I'm supposed to hold fast to it. See, that's our balance point right here. That's our balance point. Uh, the Apostle Paul told Timothy... To, to be a, a, a workman, to be diligent to present himself, a workman, approved unto God, that does not need to be ashamed by what? Rightly dividing. That's talking about cutting a straight furrow in the field. Rightly dividing the Word of God. That means I'm going to look in the Word of God and I'm going to stay right in the way. Just like Moses told the children of Israel, I'm not going to go to the right of it, I'm not going to go to the left of it, I'm going to stay right here. And if you try to pull me off to the right of it, I'm going to say, no, I'm staying right here. You go where you want to. I I, I would love for you to stay right in the Word of God because that's the way to heaven. The narrow gate and, 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 and the few people who find it. I would love for you to stay right here with me But if you go to the right, I'm not going with you. If you go to the left, I'm not going with you. I'm staying right here. That's biblical balance. That's what biblical balance is. And it is so crucially important in the life of the child of God. It says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. See, John was telling them, there's people out there that are trying to pull you off this way and trying to pull you off that way. And if they're not saying just what the Spirit of God says, then don't go with them. Don't follow them. Stay right here. That's biblical balance. And that's the only way we can make it to heaven. If we get out of balance, then we're out of the straight and narrow way. We've gone off in the ditch. And we need to get back in the road. Get back in the straight and narrow way before it costs us our eternal life. It may be this morning that you know you've not yet set foot on that straight and narrow way. In, 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 the, in the, the, the straight course of God's word, you've, you've not come, come, come in yet from your wandering to the right and to the left to start walking down that that road that leads to everlasting life. And having heard the Word of God and believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you're ready to repent of your sins and confess that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And making that confession with the mouth unto salvation, you're ready to be baptized into Christ, to have your sins washed away, so that you can begin walking the straight and narrow way in the balance of God's Word. Biblical balance, not worldly balance. Or if you know you've gotten your scale out of balance, you've got too much worldliness over here or too much uh, 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 negligence over here and, and, and your arrow's point in the wrong direction, you need to get those scales balanced out. You need to come back, making your confession known and be restored to Christ, knowing that it's only in the balance of God's Word, it's only in the straight and narrow way that we will make it to heaven, and we all want to get there together. Whatever your need is this morning, we pray that you'll come while we stand and sing.